Welcome to All Villa, No Filler. Remember to subscribe to the show. Follow us on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Joao Felix, could the Atletico Ford be on his way to Aston Villa? Media reports suggest talks are in motion. To find out more about Felix's recent form, I'm joined by Samuel Marsden, who is an ESPN writer and part of Barcelona podcast, Siempre Positivo. Uh, Samuel, thanks for coming on. Um, how did Felix perform on loan for Barcelona last season? It kind of ended up being the, the Jao Felix that we've been used to really since he joined for Atletico. Um, there was a lot of talk when he joined for Barcelona about you know that lack of consistency that he's had throughout his career. And it ended up being being a little bit the, the case at Barca. He was... I don't know if I'd say electric, but there were really promising signs at the start. Him and Jao Cancelo both signed at the same time. And the effect of those two coming into the team had sort of, um, you know, gave the team a real boost. Just having, you know, Cancelo's effect at right back, Jao on the left, Felix, sorry. Um, and yeah, Barca started really well. They had a couple of big wins. Foul, uh, Felix was scoring goals. Um, but the goals kind of dried up. Sometimes, a lot of the time with players at Barcelona, it feels hard to sort of criticise the players too much because often it's, you know, they're in and out of the team and they're coming into the team perhaps when, you know, they, they come in because someone's out and then they don't perform and then they're out again. But that wasn't really the case with Felix. Javi really gave him a run of games. He really stuck with him, um, especially in the first half of the season, probably the first two thirds of the season. He he stuck with him. He was playing every game and he, he didn't didn't deliver every game, really. It was a little bit disappointing in the end. There were good moments. He was always good against Atletico. He seems to, you know, be good in the in the big games, I guess. He seems to motivate himself, especially especially his Atletico games he scored in, in both of them. But overall, it was a little bit of a... You know, he did okay. He passed. And, and Barca were keen on the right terms and, and are keen on the right terms. We'll see, see if he ends up at Aston Villa, how, how, the, how the summer goes, to bring him back. They haven't sort of completely closed the door to bringing him or, or Jao Cancelo back. But he did end the season out of the team. Um, Javi stopped picking him. He was, he was on the bench a lot. He was replaced by Rafinha, who played on the left. Laminia Mar came in and, and played on the right. And Felix didn't get in the team for the last sort of two months, really. Um, so overall, it was probably slightly disappointing. But you do see those glimpses of talent and I guess every club kind of things. I mean, I guess you've probably had it in the past with, with Coutinho coming from, from Barcelona as well, but you get those players and you're like, well, you know, they've shown so much in, in certain matches. Can we be the club that sort of helps him, helps him kick on? And yeah, like I say, going back to the, the one doubt with, with Felix is sometimes, like I say, players have not necessarily had that run of games, whereas he has had that at, at Barca and Atletico and not shown the consistency. Right. And at, um, at Barcelona, under Xavi, was he playing a kind of in a four-three-three formation, and was he generally playing out wide, kind of as a, like clinging to the touchline, or was he a player who actually featured a little bit more centrally? Like, where what was his role at Barcelona? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So primarily, it's I mean the formation changed a little bit under Xavi, but primarily it was it was four-three-three, and in his theory. Jao Felix was wide on the left, but yeah, he had complete. He had freedom, really. He was given complete freedom to come inside, um, especially once um, Alejandro Balde got injured and and Jao Cancelo moved to left back, um, which meant the right back was Jules Kunde, which meant Jao Cancelo is obviously the attacking the attacking fullback. So the left flank was pretty much left to him, and Jao Felix was at that point given pretty much freedom to to do what he wanted to sort of come inside, play almost as sort of a number ten or a second number ten, depending on on the formation at the time. But no, he was never a a winger that, that hogs the flank, even even when he had Paps Balde or or a more defensive left back behind him, he was always someone that had freedom to to come inside. Um, and Barca would look to the fullbacks, or they would look to the right winger to to provide the width. So yeah, his he normally starts as a as a as a left sided forward, but yeah, he he, he had freedom to to come inside and, and do what he wanted. Yeah, it's interesting because I think at Aston Villa he'd likely feature in a sort of second striker role where Musa Diaby was last season, so he'd probably play off Ollie Watkins if he came to Villa and sort of link up probably closely with Leon Bailey on on the right. The second striker tends to hang out on the right hand side a little bit more for Villa. Um it'd be an interesting probably have quite a different role for him than he was at having at Barcelona. But um it, you know the, the question about him is you know he went from I think it was Benfica to Atletico for a huge amount of money. He's sort of gone on you know he's bounced around a little bit, been on loan to Chelsea, Barcelona. He's kind of lost the face of Diego Simeone. What is it with him? I mean, is is he how good actually is he? Do you think that's the thing? You see games and moments certainly when he's been at Atletico Madrid, probably because of the fee, probably because he was younger, where you saw him and you know beat three or four players and score or nearly score a, a wonder goal, and then yeah, then he disappear for games. So at his best, he's you know one of the. I, I mean, I think when he went to Atletico, and there are probably times when he was at Atletico because there were certainly spells at Atletico when he was better than Barcelona. When we were talking about you know he could be the player, you know, because we're going back what three or four four years now where you're talking about he could be the player that sort of fills the or is going to be among the players that sort of fills this you know messy 
messy sort of Ronaldo void when when they're gone. Um, and he's never quite kicked on. A lot of the thing there was a lot of discourse around the around Atletico, and I guess there is often with Diego Simeone and players and this idea that they don't buy into his work ethic or whatnot. Nothing's been explicitly said, but there's it's clear that the relationship between Simeone and Jao Felix is is damaged. It's clear that Jao Felix has sort of suggested that, you know, the Atletico style didn't suit him, which is true. I mean, if you yeah. look at Atletico, Griezmann's had to sacrifice a lot to fit into that style and he's probably the only player. I'm sure, I mean, there'll have been others in the years, but, you know, that, that comes to mind that is a player who is, you know, more sort of attacking, wants more sort of attacking freedom and, and that sort of, you know, flair player that has adapted and, and really sort of thrived under under Simeone. A lot of others have, have failed to do so and the players that have done well, you know, more hardworking forwards like, you know, Diego Costa, Luis Suarez, etc. Um, so yeah, I mean, but there were there were good moments with Jao Felix. It's it's hard to know. It's, it's, it feels like we've got to that point now. It felt like Barca was perhaps make or break, but it feels a little bit like that every season because he is still young. Um, yeah. So he could go to Villa in the Champions League, and and if he feels like the main man, he he could potentially kick on and and be one of those those top level players. But yeah, a lot of the the, the discourse, like I said, around that Atletico game was just it just comes back to the consistency. I think it was Griezmann that said it. So the the, the two things were that perhaps you know. I mean, and there were times at Barca when he did work hard, but there were also times at Barca when he was perhaps, you know, off in the press and, and Barca would concede and he would be singled out. So the idea that one, perhaps he sort of switches off or doesn't have the same sort of work rate or mentality as you would associate more with Atletico than, than Barca, but also with Barca, what Barca want, what Barca need to recover, because Barca have been atrocious for the last few years, haven't they? But this idea that they need to press harder, work better as a team, he, he switched off a little bit. Um, but there are moments when he can switch on. And then, yeah, the idea that consistency, that he'll drift in and out of, of games or have spells where he's good and spells where he's bad, they're the, the, the two main things, really, that haven't really developed in the last last few years that you kind of let a youngster get away with. But now he's, what, 24, is he now? Mm. Um, you're sort of looking for, for a little bit more responsibility. Well, we did get, you know, we got burnt a bit with Coutinho a couple of years ago. There were one or two flashes from him, but ultimately I think we got him when he was pretty much past his Absolutely past his best. And, uh, you know, but and so I've seen a few comparisons, obviously, between Jao Felix and, and Coutinho. But I guess, you know, the argument would be actually Jao Felix is still not even at his peak yet. He's still a few years away from that um, and maybe just hasn't found his home, uh, which perfectly suits his style, I guess. And I guess with Coutinho, is it an unfair comparison to make, you know, from what you remember Coutinho going from Barcelona to Villa, that it was Coutinho kind of past it in a way, whereas... Jao Felix, there's still a, there's still a ceiling for him to hit. That's what I say with Felix. Like there's this this temptation to say that it's make or break now, but it is true that he is still 24. He does still have you know his best years ahead of him. In theory, does he just need to find the the right environment? Does he just need to find the right coach? Does he just need to find the right setup that gives him the necessary sort of tools to to deliver the potential that he's had since he burst onto the scene at Benfica? I don't know. There are questions that I guess will be answered in time. I think the Coutinho, yeah, the Coutinho comparison is slightly different. We've seen Coutinho have his best years at, at Liverpool, at, at Barca. He had started okay and then was on the on the way down. He was obviously older, um, different type of player in in some ways, I guess as well. Um, so I, I can see why the the comparison can be made, and there are merits to to make it. But yeah, I I I wouldn't be scared if I was a Villa fan because of that comparison. I wouldn't think they were the same thing, if that makes sense. Despite having reservations about other elements of of Simon Gell Felix. Okay, and just a couple more questions, actually. Um, so, uh, if Barcelona had the financial ability to do so, um, would they sign both Nico Williams and Joao Felix this summer, if if that was a possibility? It's a good question because obviously it's so conditioned by by the club's finances. If they could sign one player, they would sign Nico Williams right now. Um, yeah. That's clear. That's evident. Um, but and then. Not so much to do with them if they had the finances. It's then to do with the other makeup of the squad. Um, so they would like to sign, you know, a, a Danny Olmo or potentially mm. a Jao Felix. I think Danny Olmo is probably ahead of Jao Felix now, and they're not similar players. But like you say, even though you know Nico would be on the left, whether in this four-two-three-one that Flick plays, Jao, Jao Felix would be able to play in the in the middle between between um, Nico if he signs hypothetically and, and Lamine Yamal with with Lewandowski up front, whether that's something Flick would want. So, so it's not clear, really. What is what is clear, speaking to the club, is that uh, Jao Cancelo is is more of a priority than, than Jao. Jao Felix fallen a long way down their, their list of list of priorities, but it will be conditioned by by money, etc. If they had money, I, if they had money, I, they would sign Nico Williams, Danny Olmo, Jao Cancelo, and, you know, a, another midfielder, perhaps a defensive midfielder. And then perhaps if they couldn't get one of them, then they'd look at Felix. He'd probably be their, their first backup in like a, in like a dream window. 
And I think, you know, obviously Barca have Robert Lewandowski up front, so he's the, he's the main talisman up there. But um, can, it's how versatile is Felix? Can he play in quite a variety of positions? And can he even play as a striker? Just trying to think now. There were a couple of games when he did play as a nine. Not from the start, I don't think. If it was from the start, I think, you know, Javi often preferred... I mean, the, the the young kid that just gone to Chelsea started a couple of games, Mark Yu. Uh, Victor Roque obviously came in and started a couple. Of, Ferran Torres was preferred as a nine to, to Jao Phoenix. But there were moments in games when when he did play. And he, he is an emergency option there, I would say, rather than, you know, someone something you'd look to use on a regular basis. Because he does, yeah, that was that was how I see it. And from speaking to Javi and what we've heard from from Javi, obviously we've not seen it in practice a lot because of the other options that, that Javi preferred. But in theory, he can play there. He can play from the right. But I certainly think, like you say, his best position is probably sort of inside left or on the left or as a sort of number 10 or a, a second striker. He, I think he says his best position is a second striker, but I'm just having doubts if that's what he says now or, or sort of an inside left. But yeah, that's that would be his, his best role. Okay. And um, you know, basically, do you think that, what you know of Unai Emery from, you know, watching Spanish football for such a long time. Do you think there's a chance that Aston Villa, a team that's kind of on a upward trajectory and wants to become a regular Champions League club, um, and with a manager in Unai Emery who has a track record of working with, you know, players who at times maybe haven't found their home or hit their, you know, full potential um, elsewhere... Do you think that that actually might be the exact perfect place for João Felix to go to right now? I don't know because I haven't given I haven't given João Felix to Aston Villa a lot of thought to be honest. Um, what with the Euros and then a little bit of time off and stuff. So I've been sort of thinking while we've been talking about what sort of fit João Felix would be under Emery because obviously you know even though the style of football is very different to to Diego Simeone, it still involves you know a lot of a lot of work and. The idea with Jao Felix is whether he could buy into that and be one player as opposed to being the one player who's perhaps given sort of, you know, slightly less responsibilities in, in terms of pressing. And I don't think there is a player that, that fits that mould in, in an Unai Emery team. Mm -hmm. So he would certainly have to sort of sort of step up there. I, th I think he's also, there's also, when you talk about any consistency in any player and when you talk about player players especially, there is also the element of, you know, feeling loved, feeling wanted. And and Jao Felix was happier at Barcelona. He did feel like he wanted to be there, which we didn't see at Atletico Madrid. So if he goes to Aston Villa, if he feels like he's, you know, one of the, the main men, if he's given that sort of run at the start and feels confident, then, then maybe he could fall in, fall on his feet and fall into the system there. But yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I, if I was Aston Villa supporter, I would certainly be excited because he's got so much potential um, to be sort of, you know, a top, top player within the European game. So I don't want to play it down too much, but I'm just we, I've I've sort of said this so many times. Obviously, when he came to Barcelona, when he left Atletico for Chelsea, and this idea that a fresh start could could help him, could could help him kick on. But I don't want to say he, he definitely will. So there's certainly reservations there. But he would be an exciting signing nonetheless. I'd certainly look forward to to watching Villa to see how he does. Okay, well, brilliant. Thank you very much, Samuel. I really appreciate you coming on. And um, for those who don't know, where can we find you and your work online? Yeah, just on, on ESPN um, mainly. And yeah, we have the, the Barca podcast with, with Rick Sharma and Tony Marti here in Barcelona. Siempre Positivo. For, well, it only runs in the in the season. So for anyone who wants to keep up to date with Barca. Well, thank you very much, Samuel. And good luck to Barcelona this season. Cheers. Bye-bye.